client room. And today I'm going to tell you about something that you've heard about, obviously, it's probably why you're here, this discovery of the Higgs boson that was announced on July 4th, our Independence Day this summer. It was not a slam at the United States because it was discovered in Europe. It was to coincide with the beginning of the biggest international conference on high energy physics, which this summer was in Melbourne, Australia. So today what I hope to do is give you some idea of what this thing is, what is a Higgs boson, how it was discovered, and why it actually matters. So to start, I'm gonna show you an equation that you've all seen before, E equals mc squared. This is Einstein's famous equation. It tells you that anything that has some mass, any particle that has mass, has an energy associated with it, and that energy is the mass times the speed of light squared. C is the speed of light. Well, the reason that this is important is because if you have some energy, this means that that's equivalent to having some mass. So you can convert energy into mass and mass into energy. This is a well understood thing. It's how nuclear reactors work. But it's an amazing, amazing fact. And it's actually how particle colliders work too. Now particle physicists like to simplify things as much as possible. And so I'm gonna make this extremely simple equation actually even simpler. And I'm gonna take away something that you might view as a crucial part of this equation. I'm gonna take away the speed of light squared. So E equals M. So throughout this talk, as a particle physicist, I'm going to be referring to things that are mass as energy units, and I may even refer to things that should have energy units in mass units. So just to make you a little bit more comfortable with that, um, this is called mass energy equivalence, and I'm gonna give you some benchmark points. So you have all heard of protons and neutrons and electrons. A proton has a very small mass in what we think of as natural mass units, like kilograms. It's 1.7 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. So that's 0 0.26 more zeros, 17 kilograms, right? Very small. In energy units, what we think of as more common energy units, we can say that that's about 1 billion electron volts. And a billion is a number we can easily make a prefix for, so we'll say that's about 1 giga electron volt, which is abbreviated GeV. So GeV is our new energy unit. One GeV is the mass of one proton. Now an electron has a much smaller mass. It's about one two thousandth the mass of, an of a proton. And so we would say that that's about 0 0.00051 GeV. And all the particles have masses that we'll, we'll give, give in GeV. Okay, so if you're okay with the concept that mass and energy are basically equivalent, then I'm gonna try to convince you that temperature is also equivalent. And you've all experienced this, whether or not you recognize it. You've boiled a pot of water on your stove, which you know uses energy because you pay your energy bills, right? What's actually happening in that pot of water is that the molecules of the water are, giving, are getting energy, right? And they're moving faster and faster. The more energy they have, the faster they can move. And we interpret these energetic molecules as being hotter. The more energy it has, the hotter it is. So today, the universe is a very cold place on average. Um, but if you think back into the early history of the universe, you've probably heard before that the universe was very hot and dense in the beginning, and it was very hot. So if we think back before galaxies formed, before stars formed, into the very early universe, we can associate, uh, we can associate energies with these temperatures in the early universe. So today, the temperature on average in the universe is about 2.7 Kelvin. But that's like 2 times 10 to the minus 13 GeV, very small. If we go back into the very early universe, though, we get to GeV-sized energies. So one thing that people often talk about is that, if, is that particle colliders are looking back into the early universe. If we can understand the physics of what happens at one GeV, that's like understanding the physics of the universe when the universe was just a tiny fraction of a second old. Okay, so today we have lots of particles, but the ones that we experience in our daily lives are very limited. Electrons, protons, and neutrons, right? So let's put these guys up there. We have protons, neutrons, electrons. Those things make up atoms. We also have photons, light particles. You can see me, so we know those exist. Uh, it turns out that protons and neutrons are not fundamental particles, though. They're made up of other particles, and the particles that they're made up of are quarks. We say that protons are made of up and down quarks. Those up and down quarks are held together with gluons. So you can think about inside a proton, there are quarks and gluons all bouncing around in there holding it together. 
Okay, more particles though. Besides the electron, there are two other heavier guys that look very much like the electron, except they're heavier. And those are known as the muon and tau, and we denote them with their Greek letters. There are also lighter particles, uh, almost massless particles, that don't have any electric charge, but they have other properties in common with the electron. So each electron has an electron neutrino, there are also muon neutrinos and tau neutrinos, and again, we're using the Greek letter nu to denote, to denote a neutrino. Those together make up the particles we call leptons, so I'm just gonna group those. Now, apart, and you can notice that here that there are three sort of, you can, there are three pairs, and so we call those three generations. So far we have two quarks, but there are actually three generations of quarks too. So in addition to the up and down quark, we have the charm and strange quarks, and the top and bottom quarks and that's all the quarks, three generations of quarks. We're almost done, there are two more particles, and those are the W and Z bosons, which are the carriers of the weak force. So now we have all four of our bosons, which include the gluon and the photon. And this is what we know of as the standard model of particle physics. Okay, this is very cute, and you're welcome to buy these stuffed animals at particlezoo.net <laughs> if you're looking for a good Christmas present. But we like to group things in ways that make sense to us, right? So if you're a chemist, you would group things in the periodic table of the elements, and we're gonna group things into our table of the standard model. So we've got all of the quarks and all of the leptons in their three generations, and we've got all of the bosons over here. And this picture makes a lot of sense. And we also, in this table, they have uh, the masses, sorry, masses, charge, and spin labeled. And so we know all the properties and everything makes sense of where these things are in this table. There's one thing that doesn't make sense, though. The photon, and actually the gluon too, are both massless. They have identically zero mass. But the W and the Z are really, really heavy. So the thing that makes that make sense, what everyone thought would make that make sense, is what is known as the Higgs boson. So it's the missing piece that's really crucial for this picture to start making sense. Okay, now, I want to get to what is a Higgs boson, but I'm gonna start with something more basic. What is a particle? And it's a little bit of a rambling story, so bear with me for two slides. So what is a particle? Well, when you ask a physicist, they typically say something like, a particle is a quantum of a field, or the smallest wave in a field. But unless you really know what a field is, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Okay, so let's take a step back. What's a field? So a field is a mathematical object that has some value at each point in space and at each moment in time, right? So one of the best examples of a field is a wind field, right? If you go outside, you can measure the wind with your finger at every point around you. So it has some, the wind has some speed at every point. This is a map of the United States where the wind speed is measured 80 meters above surface because that's where they put uh, those giant turbines. Um, and this is averaged over a year, but throughout, at, at each moment in time, the wind speed has some particular value. So the wind speed is a field that has a particular value at each point in space and at each moment in time. All right, that's cool, but in particle physics, we're interested in a little bit uh, more abstract fields. You might remember from high school physics uh, that, a, that charged particles generate electric fields, right? So here we have an electron, or a negatively charged particle, and a positively charged particle. And the electric field of a positively charged particle points away from it, and it has some value at each point around this charge. And the electric field of a negatively charged particle points towards it. And you can have more uh, interesting configurations of charges. Here's a simple one with just two charges, but there will be a field that's determined by these two charges as sources of the field, right? And it has some value at every point. There is also a magnetic field, which you all, I'm sure, have refrigerator magnets, so you're somewhat familiar with this. Another good example of the magnetic field is the Earth's magnetic field, um, which the Earth acts like a bar magnet, except that our geographic north is actually the south magnetic pole. But why am I telling you about the electric and magnetic fields? So I'm getting there. It relates to particle physics. So the idea is, the first step towards getting to a particle, is to set up a field that can sustain itself. And so if you think about, um, oh, I should tell you. So if you think about it, a, a charge sitting there, any charged particle, generates an electric field. In order to generate a magnetic field, you typically need a moving charged particle. So if a charged particle moves, it has an electric field, and it generates a magnetic field. A moving charged particle, so you can think of it as the, uh, the electric field is changing, generates a magnetic field. Similarly, if you have a changing magnetic field, you will get an electric field as well. 
So what you need is a configuration of charges such that the electric and magnetic fields are both changing and sustaining each other. And this is exactly what you have. Uh-oh. This is exactly what you have in a picture that is not in this particular presentation. <laughs> All right, so this is exactly what you have, for example, for radio transmission. Um, in a radio tower has a configuration that's generating electric and magnetic fields that are both changing in a way such that they sustain each other. Now very far away from the, and, and once these fields can sustain each other, the fields can propagate, right? So very far away from our, uh, our, ant our uh, transmitter, which we'll assume is here, very far away, as these waves propagate away, you, an observer, can sit out here and look at the electric and magnetic fields changing. And so what you observe is fields that are increasing, decreasing, increasing, decreasing, right? And we call that an electromagnetic wave. So we've gotten to a wave, uh, a self-sustaining, traveling, uh, traveling field is a wave. Now the next part comes from quantum mechanics though. Once you have self-sustaining traveling waves, then you go to quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics tells you that they can't be continuous. They have to be bunched into tiny packets, right? And those tiny packets are what we call, uh, are, are quanta of the waves. Um, right, are quanta of the waves. Sorry, I'm uh, looking for my pictures that are missing here. Um, so waves, if you, if you get a bunch of quanta together, what you will see looks like a regular wave. But individually, what it is, it's made up of tiny pieces of the wave. And those tiny pieces, or wave quanta, are what we call particles. OK, so let's take a detour um, and talk just for a second about the electromagnetic field before we come back to particles. So the, I've been saying electric field and magnetic field, and occasionally I slip and say electromagnetic field, and there's a really good reason for that. So if we think about a charged particle sitting somewhere in space and us sitting somewhere near it in a spaceship observing this charged particle, we will see an electric field that's generated from this charged particle, right? So here there would be an electric field, but if the charge is at rest and we're at rest, nothing is moving, there's no magnetic field. Now, you turn your spaceship on and zoom away at some constant velocity, and then you have, you're moving, but the charge is stationary. And uh, special relativity tells us that that's exactly equivalent to the situation where you're stationary and the charge is moving. And in this case, you would have an electric field and you would have a magnetic field because now you have a charge in motion. So what this is telling you is that the, dis the relationship between the electric and magnetic field is actually very entwined. And, what we and it's so entwined, in fact, that we call it one thing. It's the electromagnetic field. OK, so going back to what is a particle. Uh, particles are quanta of fields. And I haven't told you, but they're relativistic quantum fields. You can trust me on that one. Photons are quanta of what I'm calling now the electromagnetic field, now that we're comfortable with electric field and magnetic field being sort of the same thing. But each of these particles in the standard model has a field that it is a quantum of. So electrons are quanta of the electron field, muons are quanta of the muon field, on and on. Okay, so <laughs> not updated. So um, there's an interesting relationship, though, between the quanta of the field and the field itself, especially for the force carriers. So photons are quanta of the electromagnetic field. We also say, I've put fo photons here, they're over in this bosons, or force carrying particles section of this, this chart, right? And the, the reason is that photons are force carriers of the electromagnetic force. But particles that interact electromagnetically are particles that are electrically charged. That's, I mean, a photon generates, an, or a, sorry, an electron generates an electric field. Photons, on the other hand, are electrically neutral. They do not have any electric charge. So they're, they, they're, interac they're not really interacting with the electromagnetic field, they are the electromagnetic field. And the reason that I'm going through that is that the Higgs boson has a sort of similar story. So what is a Higgs boson? Well, let's start with the Higgs field. The Higgs field is a field. It's present everywhere in space. It has a particular average value everywhere. Uh, and that value is not zero, which we'll see later is very important. The particles that interact with the Higgs field feel it as they move through it, the same way an electron would feel an electric field as it moves through it. And the way that particles interact with the Higgs field 
the thing that they feel is that it gives them mass. Now, different particles feel the Higgs field in different ways, and so they acquire different masses. And a good sort of analogy for this is if the Higgs field is snow, different people interact with the snow in different ways. And so some, my everything is out of order, some people uh, skim right over the snow and it hardly affects them at all. Other people are, tr are trudging through it on snowshoes. They're being slowed down by the fact that there is snow there. And so you can think about that might be a, an analogy for a heavier particle. And then some people have a very hard time moving through the snow. So what is the Higgs particle? Well, I can say it now. The Higgs particle is the quantum of the Higgs field, just like the, uh, the photon is the quantum of the electromagnetic field. So let's look at a little history. Things really picked up in 1962. In 1962, Phil Anderson, not a particle physicist, he was a condensed matter physicist, was studying a phenomenon called spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, it's a really cool idea, and so particle physicists did pick up on this idea. And in 1964, three separate groups published papers on spontaneous symmetry breaking for particle physics. So they needed a relativistic model of the symmetry breaking. Um, the first group was Francois Anglair and Robert Brout. Uh, there is Brout, and that's Francois Anglair talking to Peter Higgs. Peter Higgs published the next paper. Then uh, Gorelnik, Higgin, and Kibble, these three guys here, and that same year, Higgs published a second paper in which he actually said there will be a massive particle associated with this whole field and the whole deal. Now that was really important. There's another piece to the puzzle, though, because having this mechanism doesn't do everything, and that is you need to integrate it into the standard model of particle physics with all those other particles. And in 1967, Steven Weinberg, sitting right here, and Abdus Salam in the middle, uh, were able to incorporate the Higgs mechanism into the standard model so that it provided the masses for the W and the Z bosons. Remember I said that was the big problem with the standard model. Why are those two guys so much heavier? Okay, so I said the term spontaneous symmetry breaking. So let's go back and think what actually is the relationship between symmetry and this Higgs field. So, we saw already that electricity and magnetism are both manifestations of the same, same force. We call that electromagnetism, right? And so here on this, uh, this like strange plot, we have the electromagnetic force. Now Sheldon Glashow, who was the third guy in the picture with Steven Weinberg and, Sheldon, and uh, Abdus Salam, so Sheldon Glashow managed to figure out that electromagnetism and the weak force are actually unified at very high energies. So we live down here, where it's very cold and the energy is very low, and that's a mistake number two. We live down here where it's very cold and the energy is very low, but as you go to higher energies, or as you go back into the early universe, the weak nuclear force and the electromagnetic force actually start to look like the same thing. They become part of the same force, and we call that electroweak unification. Now, that's great, but the problem is that in for Glashow, the W and the Z bosons didn't have any mass, but we know that they do have mass. So how do we implement this in real life? And that's where Weinberg and Salam came in with spontaneous, and were able to incorporate spontaneous symmetry breaking into the standard model. And I think, yeah, okay, so it's possible, so the weak force and the electromagnetic force are unified at, uh, at about 100 GeV, more or less, so 100 times the mass of a proton. But if you go to even higher energies, it's possible that the strong nuclear force unifies with those. Those are called grand unified theories, with all those three forces become the same at high energy. And if you go to even higher energy still, there's one more force that could unify. And theories that do that are called theories of everything. Toe for short. Okay, so let's talk more about symmetry. So uh, for experts in the audience, please close your ears a little bit because I'm gonna gloss over some details here. Um, if you go way back into the early universe, this is always where I start, back in the early universe, right? In the early universe, it's thought that the Higgs field had, no, had a zero average value everywhere. And so what's pictured here is what's called the potential, but you can think about this as a hill that you have to climb up. It takes energy to climb up this hill, right? So if the Higgs field, if the Higgs potential, uh, if the average value is zero, the particle sits at the bottom of the potential, and it's happy. It looks around in all directions and sees the same thing everywhere, and this is a very symmetric situation, right? However, at some point, the Higgs field develops a non-zero average value. That's why I said it's important that the average value of the Higgs field is not zero. 
So when it develops this non-zero average value, there's a hill in the middle of the hill, in, in the middle of the potential. And the natural place for the particle to want to be, the lowest energy state, is displaced from the zero value. Now this is an unstable situation. So this particle is going to roll down to the place where its energy is lower. The same way if you put a marble on top of a hill, the marble will roll, roll down to the lowest energy state. When that happens though, the particle looks around and things are not symmetric anymore. The symmetry has been broken. So you can think about this the same way with a spinning top. When the top is upright, it's spinning, it's symmetrical, but that's not the lowest energy configuration. Eventually it's gonna fall over and then it doesn't look the same in each direction. So the symmetry of actually massless electroweak H bosons, so the photon, the W, and the Z, were all massless back here. But this symmetry is broken by the Higgs field when it gets a, a non-zero average value, and the W and the Z get masses from this mechanism. The thing that physicists actually care about is the mechanism of the symmetry breaking. But the only way that we can verify this picture of what happens to the Higgs field and what the Higgs field looks like now is by finding the particle that's associated with that field. We're never gonna observe the field. We can try to observe the particle. Now, there are lots of particles that we can observe, um, but most of them don't stick around for very long, and the Higgs is no different. And the reason is that most particles are not stable. So of all those particles that I showed you in the picture, very few of them will stick around for more than a fraction of a second. So if you are lucky enough to somehow create a Z boson, the Z boson will almost immediately decay into, for example, two muons. And those muons aren't stable either. Electrons are stable, but muons are not. So those muons will then immediately decay into electrons and neutrinos. Now I'm gonna try, I know you may be getting overwhelmed by all the particle names, I'm gonna try to limit things here a little bit and focus only on the W and Z bosons and the muon in my examples. So you can put, put the rest of those particles out of your mind for a while. So we've got the concept of mass energy equivalence and we have got the concept of stability. Now we're ready to talk about what happens at the Large Hadron Collider. So this is a picture of sort of a map of the LHC. This uh, yellow ring is the beam tunnel. That's where the protons circulate. It's about 100 meters underground. It's 27 kilometers in circumference. And it goes here, this uh, white dashed line is the border between France and Switzerland. So it goes in two countries, under lots of farmland and under some small towns. Uh, and there are experiments placed at multiple points around the ring. So two of the experiments that we're gonna talk about are ATLAS and CMS, which are two, the two experiments that contributed to the discovery of the Higgs boson. So what happens at the Large Hadron Collider? Well, they're colliding hadrons. A hadron is any particle that's made of quarks, basically. So protons are the things that they're colliding. They're made of quarks. And if ideally you could get two protons to bump into each other, that would be fantastic. But it's really, really hard to do that because protons are really, really small. So what you have to do instead is collide about 100 billion protons with another 100 billion protons. And in order to do that, you have bunches of 100 billion protons and you have to shrink them down to the size of one human hair at the interaction point. They do this about 40 million times uh, per second and each time there's a collision of 100 billion protons with another 100 billion protons, they get about 20 proton-proton collisions out of that. And they look like a bunch of stuff flying out. So the job of the detectors is to look at all the stuff, try to detect all the stuff that's flying out, and make some sense of it. So on the left, we have the compact muon solenoid, or CMS. It's not very compact. This is actually a person down here, or a drawing of a person. Uh, this thing is about 15 meters in diameter. The second experiment is called Atoiroidal LHC Apparatus, or ATLAS. I think they were reaching a bit for that acronym. ATLAS is even larger, it's 22 meters in diameter. But these are huge, huge experiments to detect something that's happening at a place that's smaller than a human hair. So you collide your 100 billion protons with your other 100 billion protons, and this is what it looks like. Um, and the the thing that you have to keep asking is, is there anything unexpected in that mess? It's not simple to figure out what is new in all of that stuff. So we collide two protons, right? That's what I keep saying. It's totally not what actually happens, though. Protons are made up 
well, I've also told you that protons are made up of three quarks, and that's also not really true. Protons are made up of a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, there are many, many quarks and many, many gluons in here, quarks and antiquarks and gluons, right? But on average, there are two more up quarks than anti up quarks, and one more down quark than anti down quarks. So on average, there are two up quarks and a down quark. But there's a whole bunch of stuff inside a proton. So you collide these two things, and if you're lucky, maybe a quark and an antiquark will collide, but it could be any combination of those things. Quarks and antiquarks are very convenient for us, though. When they do, you might make a new heavier particle. So the uh, energy of this collision will create a heavier particle, which means that these two quarks, which themselves aren't very heavy, but they have a lot of energy from, that was given to them from the LHC, so the motion energy of these quarks was converted into mass energy of a new particle. You no longer have quarks, now you have a new heavier thing. Of course, the thing that I created, this Z boson, decays, right? So immediately it will decay into two muons. But the muons will each carry away half of the energy of the particle that they came from, right? So when the, muon, when the Z decays to two muons, the mass energy of the Z boson has been, create, has been turned into motion energy of the decay products. So the idea now is that you just look for these decay products in your detector, whatever ends up getting into your detector, and if you measure the mass energy, uh, sorry, if you measure the motion energy of these decay products, you can infer the mass energy of the thing that you didn't even see that, that was created initially. So with the Higgs boson, the way this happens is you have a quark and an antiquark collide, right? You create a Higgs boson if you're really, really, really lucky. That Higgs boson, just like the Z, doesn't stick around for very long. And it decays to a lot of different things. So one thing it might decay to is two photons. And if it decays to two photons, that's really nice because each of them carries away half of the mass energy of the Higgs boson, right? So you could say, oh, I'll just look for two photons. So here's a, what a collision looks like. This is a whole bunch of stuff colliding, and there are two very clear, we call back-to-back -back photons going in opposite directions. And that's a, that would be a great signature. But there are lots and lots of processes at the LHC that will just create two photons, even two back-to-back -back photons. So we have to work a little bit harder. So we can try looking for different signals. Like, say we collide a quark and an anti-quark, and we create a Higgs boson if we're really, really, really lucky. And that Higgs boson maybe decays to two Z bosons. Well, those aren't stable either, so they'll decay to four muons, or a muon and an anti-muon pair. So now you have four things, right? This is more complicated. It's not just two photons anymore. Now we're looking for four things. But it turns out that the standard model can mimic that too in the absence of a Higgs. So it's really difficult to tell. In fact, it's impossible to tell if these particles actually came from, at one point, a Higgs boson or not. So how do you really know you've made a Higgs boson? You never will. There's not a single snapshot of a collision at the LHC that I can show you where I can say, I guarantee you there was a Higgs boson there. It's never going to happen. But you can use the power of statistics to determine whether or not there was a Higgs boson. So statistics. Um, the way this works is you assume that you don't have any Higgs bosons, right? And then you, you find a way to figure out how many events of some type, let's say how many two photon events, you would expect if there were no Higgs boson. And then you go out and you do your experiment and you count up all of the events and you ask, does that agree with my prediction for if there were no Higgs boson or does that not agree with my prediction for if there were no Higgs boson? So you can do the analogous thing with uh, flipping a coin, right? So let's say you, do, you flip a coin 100 times. Your hypothesis is that the coin is fair. So your background assumption your, your background projection is that you should get 50% of the time heads and 50% of the time tails, right? So you flip your coin and you get 50 heads and 50 tails. You're not surprised at all. Let's say you flip your coin and you get 55 heads and 45 tails. Yeah, you shouldn't really be surprised about that either. That's a small deviation. It happens often, right? If you get 65 heads and 35 tails, then you should start to think that maybe your assumption that your coin is fair is not a very good assumption. This should happen less than 1% of the time if you do this 100 coin flipping experiment. And so we would call that a three standard deviation uh, change from the expectation or three sigma uh, difference from your background only expectation that the coin is fair. Now if you do this experiment and you get 75 heads and 25 tails, you should definitely think something is wrong. Your background hypothesis that the coin is fair is not a good one. This should only happen 
Uh, if, you do the, if you do this 100 coin flipping experiment 3,500,000 times, this might happen once. It's a very, very rare thing. But you flipped your coin and that's what you found. And we would say that that is a five sigma deviation from your expectation. So at this point, we would say the data do not support your hypothesis of a fair coin. So the LHC is no different. They do this experiment and they have a uh, background hypothesis and then they ask, does the data fit the background only hypothesis or not? So here I'm showing you results from two different searches. On the right, this is from CMS. And you can think of this as the number of events as a function of the energy of the two photons, which I showed you before. That's pretty much just the energy of the particle that created the two photons. So the background only would be the dashed red line. And you can see that the actual data do not agree with the background only hypothesis very well. Similarly, with Atlas here, we've got a search from Atlas. This is the Higgs decaying to two W bosons. Now here, the background, only, the background only hypothesis doesn't look so smooth because there are lots of standard model processes that can create two Ws with a specific energy. So it looks like it might be a little bit harder to see if there's any excess on top of that. So if you add up all of the standard model stuff without a Higgs boson that could create two Ws, it would look like the top of this purple region. And you can see that the data are quite a bit above that. So uh, they've given you this red, the red uh, upper lines here to, to guide your eye as to the signal that you would expect if there were 125 GeV Higgs boson in the data. So both teams did searches in multiple channels, not just the ones I'm showing here. And at the end of the day, CMS found that their uh, background only hypothesis is not well fit. They found a 5.3 sigma deviation from background only hypothesis. And they measured the Higgs mass to be about 125 GeV, a little more. Similarly, Atlas found a total significance of almost six sigma. So it's very, very, very unlikely that, that uh, this is created just by the background, right? And furthermore, it's really unlikely that both experiments would independently find the same significance of signal with Higgs masses that agree to within the errors quoted here. So we have a Higgs mass at about 125 to 126 GeV. So everybody celebrates, and I assure you that physicists are actually better at celebrating than is evident from this picture. <laughs> there were, so this, this was a big event. Um, these two pictures are from CERN. This is actually Peter Higgs congratulating Fabiola Giannotti, who's the spokeswoman for the Atlas experiment. Uh, and this is the hall just after the, the seminars concluded. Uh, people were watching at all of these national laboratories around the world. This is Fermilab, but they were all over the world. A ton of us, though, were at the International Conference for High Energy Physics. And so we were watching in a big auditorium. They postponed our cocktail hour so that we could all go and watch this together. And I actually realized that you can see me. I am in the audience right back there. <laughs> you squint. So why should you care? So it's been discovered. We're pretty sure it's been discovered. Why should you care? Well, the first reason is obvious. Our understanding of the laws that govern the universe has improved. And that's great if you're a particle physicist. But if you're not a particle physicist, that doesn't really affect your daily life that much, right? So there are other reasons, though. Um, first of all, basic science pushes the limits of technology. And that leads to developments that do impact our daily lives. So for example, scientists at CERN years ago were trying to figure out a way to really efficiently share their data. And they developed something that we now know of as the World Wide Web. And so I think we're all glad that they were there working on their data and developing the World Wide Web. I certainly benefit from this several times during the day. Um, related to that though, is the fact that some of the most important advances that our civilization have seen have been unexpected consequences of fundamental research. And the internet is a little bit of an example of that. Another example is J.J. Thompson, um, who was working in England in the 19th century. And he was working on studying currents in near vacuum conditions, which sounds very obscure. And certainly in 19th century England, it was very obscure. But what he discovered was the electron, which basically led to all of modern electronics, right? And we're all very glad that that happened too. But I'm sure people asked him, why aren't you working on something more practical, like steam engines? All right, finally, the, uh, perhaps the most compelling reason um, that you should care uh, is one word that came from Lynn Evans, who is the guy that's basically credited with designing and having the LHC built. And what he said was inspiration. If you, if you inspire a kid, if a kid hears about this or a teacher tells a kid about this, um, or their parents or their friends tell them, and they get excited about it and they wanna learn about math and science, 
that is a thing that moves our society forward. And so it's like, it's uh, undoubtedly a good thing and an important thing for us to keep doing. So there's actually one more reason why I care, which you may not care so much about, but I hope that you do, and I hope that I convince you to care for this reason by the end of my talk. And that is that the discovery of the Higgs boson informs my approach to other outstanding problems in particle physics and cosmology. There are more problems. Just because we found the Higgs boson does not mean we're done yet. So two of those problems are, one has to do with the Higgs itself. The Higgs mask is unstable. And that's a little bit more obscure, and I'll get back to it at the end of the talk. But the other reason, which I'll start with, is that there, there is no, currently no explanation for dark matter in the universe. So let's start with this dark matter. There is a ton of evidence for dark matter. We have known about it for decades and decades. Um, I'll start with the most easy to understand evidence. And that came from a woman named Vera Rubin who was studying something called galactic rotation curves. This happened in the 60s and 70s. So here you have a galaxy, uh, and things are rotating around this mass distribution. They're orbiting the galaxy, right? And so if you think about what causes that orbit, what causes the speeds of the particles in those orbits, it's really just the gravitational attraction of the stuff inside the orbit, all that mass, right? So you can calculate using standard Newtonian mechanics the relationship between the speed at which something is rotating around this galaxy and the mass contained within its orbit. So what you find is that the rotational velocity should go like, one, like the square root of Newton's constant g times the mass contained within its orbit divided by the radius of its orbit. So if you go way outside this galaxy and you find a particle that happens to be orbiting it, test particle, um, what you should find is if you're outside of all the mass, then this m of r will be constant, and the rotational velocity will go like one over the square root of r, so it'll decrease. So you go out and measure it, this so is the rotational velocity as a function of radius, and that's not at all what you find. What you find is that the rotational velocity is constant as you go to larger and larger radii. Weird, right? So this do the dashed line here indicates the expectation if the visible matter were all that was there, and even back when this was produced in 1991, we knew that there was more stuff than just the visible stuff. There was some gas that you couldn't see. And so the gas contributes a little bit to the rotational velocity, but there's a big discrepancy here. And the way that you can solve that discrepancy is by introducing something else that is massive, but that you can't see. So we call that the dark matter halo. Okay, so there's evidence on a variety of scales. Those were galaxies. There's also evidence from galaxy clusters um, the first evidence for dark matter actually came from galaxy clusters. This guy, Fritz Zwicky, um, was basically doing the same thing. He was measuring the velocities of, instead of stars now, the velocities of galaxies that were orbiting in a galaxy cluster. And so you have a similar story. There's a relationship between the velocity at which the galaxies in the cluster are rotating and the total mass enclosed right, the total mass of the galaxy cluster. So here's a picture of the coma cluster, and you can't see much in it, but what Fritz Zwicky found was that the velocities that he measured implied that there was much, much more mass in this cluster than, than just what you could count up by looking at the visible stuff in it. So he wrote, in 1933, if this overdensity is confirmed, we would arrive at the astonishing conclusion that dark matter is present with a much greater density than luminous matter. 1933, and we still don't know what it is. Today we have fancier telescopes, um, but the story is still pretty much the same. So this is some of the more modern evidence. Uh, this is a picture from, most of this is from the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see galaxies are these bright things. Uh, there are two other important pieces of information that have been superposed on top of this, though. So in what you're looking at here is actually a picture of two galaxy clusters that have had a head-on collision very recently. And if you look carefully, you can see that there's a clump of galaxies here, and there's another clump of galaxies over here. Now, a galaxy cluster is made primarily of hot gas. That's the most massive component of it. And with X-ray measurements, we can actually track where the hot gas is. Now, when this, these two galaxy clusters had a head-on collision, the gas interacts electromagnetically, and so it gets all tangled up with itself. But the galaxies themselves act like just massive bodies, and they fly right by each other. So if you track the, uh, the hot gas, you'll find that it's stuck in the middle in this red region. OK, so we've got the gas separated from the galaxies. No big deal, right? The next step is we want to find out where is the, 
the total mass. Where is most of the mass in this picture? And so that we can figure out with weak gravitational lensing. Weak gravitational lensing tells us that the mass distribution is what's given by these blue regions. The mass doesn't follow the hot gas. The mass follows the galaxies. So that means that the most dominant component in these galaxies is something that interacts gravitationally. So it's not the most massive thing of the, of the gas and the galaxies, it's something else. You cannot explain this picture unless you have some dark matter that interacts gravitationally and follows those galaxies. So today, all measurements agree. What we've got, uh, it's called the concordance model. What we've got is that the energy density of the universe is almost 30% matter. There's some other stuff there too. Uh, but of the energy density of the universe, of that matter, about 5% of it, or a little bit less, is baryonic, and the other 23% is something that is not any of the particles that we know about. So it's the dark matter. So here's the current status. Some explanation is needed for the observed gravitational weirdness, right? Galaxy rotation curves, all of the cluster dynamics, and there are a whole bunch of pieces of evidence that I haven't told you about. We also know that it's not any of the particles that make up you or me or the stars or the gas. It's not any of the particles from the standard model. And we know that because we have very good calculations of how much of each element there should be in the universe, how much helium there is in the universe. And those calculations rely on the fact that only 5% of the universe is in matter like you and me, baryonic matter. So it's not standard model particles. We know how much of it there is. We know that it's not electrically charged um, otherwise, it would form bound states with regular matter. We don't observe that. We also know that it's still around us today. Uh, so it's either stable, it doesn't decay, or it's really, really long-lived. Uh, those other particles that I was telling you about decay in a tiny fraction of a second, but this is still around in the universe today. And finally, we say that it's non-relativistic or cold. What we mean is that the particles are moving slowly enough that they can clump together to form the structure in the universe. So not standard model particles, even though you would really like it to be because we've already got enough particles. There are two more options. You could have some new dark matter particles just for the sake of having dark, more dark matter particles for explaining this thing. Or there are other reasons to think that there's physics, more particles beyond just the ones in the standard model. And it could be one of those. So personally, I find it more compelling to kill two birds with one stone, but we don't know yet if that's the right way to look at the situation. So, Point, the point here, though, is that the standard model of physics is still incomplete. One of those particles could be the dark matter particle. So when I say incomplete, what do I mean? Let's go back to that story about the Higgs mass. So the problem, as I stated it before, is that the Higgs mass is unstable in the quantum field theory. What that means is a little bit tricky. We know now what the Higgs mass is. It's 125 GeV, more or less. Particle, like the Higgs field, interacts with all massive particles. So specifically here, it interacts with all particles in the standard model that have mass. Now, in quantum field theory, that means that the Higgs mass gets quantum corrections from all the particles that interact with it. So here you have a top quark interacting with a Higgs boson. And the, the size of those corrections is the problem. So those, you would like your quantum field theory to be valid up to very high energies, much, much higher than the mass of the Higgs, right? But this capital lambda here actually is the highest energy in your theory that your theory should be valid at. So if you want your theory to be valid to very high energies, that means that the corrections to your Higgs mass are much, much bigger than the Higgs mass itself. And that's weird. Now, new particles can actually help this situation. You would think they might make it worse because that's more particles that interact with the Higgs field, right? But they actually help the situation because different kinds of particles create different kinds of corrections. And in fact, some particles can enter and exactly cancel this. They just have exactly the same size but the opposite sign. So you cancel the quadratic divergences, these, this problematic term, if you have a certain kind of new particles. All right, new particles fix this problem with the Higgs mass. New particles could also explain dark matter. So do they? And I personally think that they do, as I already alluded to. Um, but you have to put that inside a theory. And so the theory that I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about in the last couple minutes is called supersymmetry. 
This is the only possible extra symmetry that you can add to the standard quantum field theory, to standard four-dimensional relativistic quantum field theory. Um, and I, a lot of my colleagues say it would be a real shame if nature didn't take advantage of that symmetry. So supersymmetry basically is a symmetry between fermionic particles like quarks and electrons and bosonic particles like the force carrying particles, photons and gluons. Because of this symmetry, each standard model particle gets a supersymmetric partner that's the opposite type. So we have a whole bunch of new particles now. So let's take a look at that. We've got the standard model particles, we make a copy, and then we start changing particles. So here is our supersymmetric copy. Um, all of the quarks, they're no longer quarks, they're bosonic partners, so they have different spin. So we, call, we denote them with a tilde, but we also call them scalar quarks or squarks. <laughs> the so uh, the leptons all get, uh, all get scalar partners as well, and so we call them scalar leptons or sleptons. And these guys make up the sphermions rather than fermions. And now we have to deal with these bosons. Well, the easiest one is the gluon. That becomes the gluino. It's a fermion, kind of like an electron now. And then we have these other guys. And they mix together and give, give us neutral things that we call neutralinos and charged things that we call charginos. One more thing missing, right? Where's the Higgs boson? In supersymmetry, you actually have many Higgs bosons. It's necessary to make the theory, uh, to, to make the theory correct. And so in the supersymmetric sector, you have many Higgsinos. So we have a whole lot of new particles, but what does that mean? So the outstanding questions are about the Higgs mass and its stability. What is the dark matter? Those two questions are relatively easy to answer. The other questions, though, are, have to do with unification of the strong force with the weak and electromagnetic forces. And what about gravity? So if we go back to this picture, it turns out that supersymmetry can handle all of these and is sort of a necessary ingredient for the unification of gravity. So supersymmetry lives up here. It's a theory that can explain the unification of the weak electromagnetic and strong nuclear forces. And it's necessary for any, any theory that wants to get past it, more or less. So what does supersymmetry look like? This is a very basic picture, um, something from my research life. This is in preparation. Uh, these two things on the axes are listed in GeV. So these are mass scales. In fact, they're the mass scales of these new supersymmetric part particles. So they're GeV on both axes. But if you remember, the Higgs mass is 100 GeV. That's way down here in this corner. So these are much, much larger masses than the standard model particles that we're used to. I get very excited about this particular region here. So what's happening in this place is that this turquoise or green region, that represents the region in the supersymmetric parameter space where the dark matter happens to be a supersymmetric particle. And if you look at and do the calculation for what happened to these particles in the early universe, it happens to work out that they have exactly the right amount of dark matter in the universe today. They make up just that amount. That did not have to happen, but it did happen, and it happened right here. So that's already good. We can explain dark matter, and it tells us where in our parameter space what the masses of these particles are that will allow us to explain the dark matter. But there's something more important going on here, and that has to do with the Higgs boson. So these red contours, the red dashed lines, tell me what the Higgs boson mass is. And, whoops. And this one right here, is the one that slices right through that region where, there's, where the dark matter is exactly explained. And that contour is the contour of a Higgs mass of 126 GeV. So right around this spot, I, supersymmetry predicts a Higgs boson that has exactly the mass of the Higgs boson that's been discovered. And I've solved the dark matter in the universe problem. And that's fantastic. I can assure you that I have a stack this high of plots that look just like this where this does not happen. <laughs> so, the Higgs boson discovery affects my daily life in a very real way. I have to think about it every day, and it affects my research. Um, yes, and it also affects where, um, where this is going. So what's next? Is the thing that has been discovered a standard model Higgs, or is it a supersymmetric Higgs, one of them, or is it something completely different that we haven't thought of yet? In order to figure out the answer to that, we have to learn more about it. So the things that we can measure are the mass, and the uh, decay channels, the decay rates. So we've been talking about the Higgs decaying to two photons, right? 
So if you look at what the, um, at, if you look at the relative decay uh, rates of these different decays, so Higgs to two photons or to Z bosons or W bosons, you can put them on a plot for how far they are away from what you would expect if it were just a very boring old standard model Higgs with nothing interesting else about it. And so you put all of these decay rates on a plot that looks like this. This one is from the CMS collaboration. And what you find is that there are a few that don't quite agree with the standard model expectation. So maybe it's not really just a standard model Higgs. And in fact, the ATLAS collaboration finds the same problem with this Higgs to two photon rates. It's a little bit higher than we would expect. It's way too early though to say whether or not this is a standard model Higgs or if it's something more exotic. So things we don't know yet, what type of Higgs it is. We actually don't know whether it's a fundamental particle or if it's a complex particle it, or a composite particle. It could be just like, uh, like a proton made up of things like quarks and gluons. We don't know that yet. Or it could be something that's much crazier than anything that anyone has thought of yet. So in the supersymmetric scenario, if it is a supersymmetric Higgs, then it's important to know how heavy we expect the other supersymmetric particles to be and whether they can be discovered at the LHC. But if supersymmetry is actually the theory that describes nature, then we've already learned a fair amount just by knowing how heavy the Higgs boson is. So here is uh, just a little snapshot of how far the LHC has come and what the plans are for the future. So in September, on September 10th, 2008, they had their first beam. The LHC turned on and there was a great celebration. And then nine days later, they had a complete magnet failure and that shut it down for over a year. Uh, so in 2009, November of 2009, they had their first beam after repairs. In, uh, at the end of November, they had actual particle collisions very quickly thereafter. And we've been talking about CMS and ATLAS, but there are two other detectors. By March 30th, that marked the start of the LHC research program, when they finally got the energy up to 7 TeV. So that's a collision energy of 7,000 times the mass of the proton. They shut down uh, for the winter, uh, and in 2011, they began their 2000, in March, March 13th, they began their 2011 run. After a short shutdown, they upgraded to 8 TeV by April 5th. And on July 4th, of course, we now have to put the Higgs discovery on every timeline. In February, they're planning to shut down again, and this is going to be a very big shutdown because they're gonna almost double the collision energy of the LHC. So there, we hope that there are lots of interesting things to come in the future. This is gonna open up a lot of possibilities for supersymmetry and dark matter, and even for learning more about the Higgs boson itself. So what we know is that a new particle has definitely been discovered. We think it may be the Higgs, but it could just be a Higgs. It could be a supersymmetric Higgs, or it could be something slightly different than any Higgs boson. We don't actually know yet, but more results are coming soon for the Higgs boson, for dark matter, for supersymmetry, and for other even more exotic searches. And so the LHC is on the case. I hope that I've given you reason to be happy about the Higgs discovery, and also reason to be hopeful that this won't be the last time we're celebrating an awesome discovery from the LHC. Well, thank you. Okay, thanks, Paul. That's, that's a wonderful talk, and it really helped out me to understand exactly how this all fits together. I'm sure the the audience has lots and lots of questions, and we can have I think maybe about ten minutes to ask a few questions here. So. Uh, please raise hands and I'll pick randomly here. Okay. <laughs> Is there actually any evidence to say that the experiments over there are dangerous? People seem to believe that uh, there might be the end of the world enough. Well, the yeah, I don't believe that the experiments are dangerous. Um, so the collision energy at the LHC is very high. It's high for us. It's the largest, most powerful man-made collider. But there are actually particle collisions happening all around us all the time because there are very high energy cosmic rays that are bombarding our atmosphere all the time. And if you do the calculation, so many cosmic rays have bombarded the atmosphere and we're all still here that there's really nothing to worry about about the collisions at the LHC. Yes? Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, antimatter is not so mysterious anymore. Um, I, I told you, I showed you pictures of two muons coming out when a Z decays. One of those is actually antimatter, right? Same thing as a positron is an antimatter to an electron. Um, so antimatter is something that we understand. It's not worrisome anymore. Um, the question of how gravity is integrated, though, is a big deal, and nobody knows the answer to that question. Are you talking about modified gravity theories? Yeah, modified gravity. Uh, I see, for, for dark matter, right. Yeah, so um, for, as far as dark matter goes, yeah, there are many theories of modified gravity, and it's difficult to sort of make a blanket statement about all of them. What is true is that the most simple versions, the most naive versions of modified gravity, can't explain things like the bullet cluster, right? Where you know how the, you, can, you can see how the masses are moving and you can do the calculation. And there's really no way to explain that observation without including some dark matter component. That said, um, there is definitely still room for modified gravity. And I don't know the answer. Nobody knows the answer yet. Way in the back. Yeah, so Hubble can't actually see the dark matter. It can tell us, we can see the visible stuff with, with uh, Hubble, which by learning how the visible stuff moves, we can learn about the distribution of dark matter. And James Webb is gonna be really interesting. Um, I could tell you a whole story about interesting things that James Webb Space Telescope is gonna find. Uh, the great thing about JWST is that it's gonna be able to see back in time really far. <laughs> so as far as telescopes can see, basically. Um, and that may indirectly end up telling us some things about dark matter if they learn about early star formation. But telescopes are all, are pretty much, well, I shouldn't even say that. Uh, the current telescopes are main, astronomical telescopes, are mainly focused on, uh, are mainly able to see the bulk properties of dark matter, not necessarily the particle properties of dark matter. Um, there is a whole industry of looking for dark matter annihilations, which you can see with telescopes like the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, um, or AMS, which is flying now. These are both satellites. But that's a whole other story for another time. But it's a very, there's, yeah, tons to talk about. <laughs> They do, actually, yeah. It's a lot of particles. It's a lot of particles. <laughs> and uh, another question is, how on Earth do you upgrade a large power on collider to handle yeah. the whole team? Do you have to upgrade new energy sources and the system itself to handle that? Yeah, so the way that you control, so protons are charged. And a, a charged particle, um, you have a charged particle that you want to curve. So you need to control it with magnets in order to make it curve around the ring. So you have to upgrade all of those magnets. You also have to upgrade the initial acceleration mechanism that gets them moving that fast in the first place. But it's all done through magnets. So it's a lot of magnet technology. There are. <laughs> there are particle physics explanations for a lot of things. Um, yeah, there are models um, where dark energy and dark matter sort of share some of the same properties and are part of the same element of the universe. Um, there are many. Dark energy is a little bit more mysterious than dark matter, though, because our observations of dark matter are, um, well, part of it is that they're understandable. Like, there are so few things that could mimic what we're looking at as, as dark matter. Okay, one, one more question. Uh, please go over here. 
but we'll go to the view after. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, um, no, is the short answer. <laughs> okay, well, first of all, thank you for letting me ask this question. I've been trying to get an answer for maybe like a year. <laughs> Second of all, the question itself. So, yes, we know that the HP code is not the HP, the HP deal is really just to drag on the part of the HP from that. But what I'd love to know is why some part of the over us. Yeah, it's because they interact with the Higgs field in different ways. So that may be the thing that distinguishes them, is how they interact with the Higgs field. Um, you can think about the difference between quarks and, like, between a quark and an electron, is that a quark has not an integer number of charge, it has a fractional charge, like two thirds or one third. That's weird too, why does that happen? So. Yeah, there's, there's not a great answer to that question. Uh, there are people who are very interested in this question, though. It is a, an area of ongoing research. Why do they have such different masses? The Higgs, boson, the Higgs field has to exist to give them mass, but that's not the end of the question. Okay, so I think we'll close here, and I'll just remind people that Pearl Fittich is a professor in the physics department and astronomy department here, and so it's very nice that you can actually come and visit and say hello and ask more questions if you wish, either now or sometime in the future, if you come back <laughs> in the apartment, I'm sure yes, you indeed. might actually be able to do that.